here we go. All right, so uh, hi, this is uh, Jeremy Shulman. Uh, go by Network Automaniac on Twitter. And today I'm joined by John Capibianco. Did I say that right? Pretty good, pretty good, yep. Okay, and today I wanted to do something just a little different from watch Jeremy write code or hear Jeremy blather on about his viewpoints of network automation. Uh, today, what I wanna do is uh, work directly with an expert network engineer, John, who's got a uh, dangerous knowledge of Python and work through a problem uh, that we think is probably every problem a network engineer has. So we talked about that beforehand. And John, why don't you uh, first introduce yourself a bit and then let's talk about the problem we're gonna work, work through together. Yeah, so I'm really excited to be here today. Jeremy reached out and um, I was really excited to see the new things he's going to show me. Um, I've been in IT for a long time. I'm with the Canadian House of Commons as an IT integrator and planner. And you probably more know me for my open source work in the community, uh, trying to use network automation tools to solve problems. The problem that Jeremy and I thought would be a good one today is finding a MAC address. Now at scale and in these large complex networks, um, sometimes being able to locate a device. Now, the MAC address is going to be the unique identifier for, right, not just a PC, but a security camera, a door swipe, um, the, the NIC that the database appliance is on, right? Like we, these MAC addresses, we live and die by them. And I've had my CISO phone me directly and say, we need this MAC now, right? There could be a malware, there could be, a ransomware, there could be some problem. And, and we, right, it's the postal code. It's the identifier of where that is in the topology of potentially tens of thousands of interfaces. Right, right. So what we're gonna do is jump right into the coding uh, and uh, I'm going to use a modern uh, mechanism or facility or feature of Python called async IO. Uh, as John mentioned, the problem is difficult because of scale. You know, you might have, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of network devices that you would need to figure out, you know, or interrogate where or who has this MAC address. So I'm going to jump right in. I'm going to uh, share my screen here. Uh, so what you should be seeing uh, momentarily is my PyCharm screen. Now I use uh, PyCharm as my uh, integrated development environment or IDE. Um, everybody uh, could have a different one. Uh, John, I think you use VS Code. Um, yes, I uh, use VS Code, and I'm excited to see PyCharm. Uh, Jeremy and I both, you know, we share the opinion of pick one and start using one. I'm not religious about what one you use, and we have differing tools. So this is exciting for me to see this from the from another perspective. Yeah, yeah, I definitely recommend if you're brand new to writing uh, Python code or any code, um, you know, pick up a good uh, IDE because. Uh, VI is is not a great approach to learn uh, and navigate a new programming language. So in PyCharm, this is just a welcome screen. I'm going to click new project. And uh, what I'm going to do here is uh, just select pure Python. They have a whole bunch of options for creating, you know, skeletons of, of things like if you want to build a Django app or a Flask app or such. But I am going to do uh, a new project called uh, find Mac address. And I'm going to create a new virtual environment for that. And it's going to be based on Python 3.8. Uh, Jeremy, that's, um, that's interesting to me that uh, this will reduce the friction. I know sometimes introducing virtual environments in Python to beginners, there's a bit of a, you know, there's a bit of a hurdle there. Uh, this is incredible that it will actually spin up your virtual environment as part of this project. Yeah, yeah. So if I click this, I'm just going to click create down here. And, and what this does is it's going to, uh, sometimes PyCharm bops in and out. So I'm gonna have to share the screen again. That's just, a, I don't know why Zoom does that with PyCharm, but uh, we're back with PyCharm. You can see it created a, a VENV directory here. This is the virtual environment. Uh, and we, you know, we can get right, right, you know, right going. Now I'm going to open up uh, the properties of my project by hitting a command uh, comma. And I don't know, can you see the preferences we cannot. Here. No, it's faded. Okay, so I'm going to stop uh, sharing and I'm going to share my entire desktop because I was a little concerned about that. I'm going to share my entire desktop now. And now you should see this preferences. We do, panel. yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, in, in PyCharm, these are all the things that you can control. And under project, uh, we can go to the PyCharm. Uh, 
Python interpreter. And right now there's no interpreter set, which I find a little confusing because I just said create one. So I'm gonna pick one under this show all, you can see that um, I have just created one called uh, find, let's see, where is it? Uh, where is my find Mac addresses? I thought I just created that. Is it the remote one on the bottom there? No, no, no. Uh, PyCharm actually allows you to do um, remote uh, development. So I can like have a Python running on another machine, like a jump server and, right. uh, and then use that. So I'm going to do just a, a, one little thing here. I'm going to exit out of PyCharm and you can see like, I'm going to click find Mac address again, just to open that project up. And I'm going to then hit command minus. And so now PyCharm, you know, finds it. I don't know, that's like a little quirk of PyCharm. Sometimes I have to exit and come back in. Um, don't know why that is, but you can see by default, these are the only packages that are in uh, my virtualized environment. Now, I'm going to do a demonstration uh, to find a MAC address, and I, I use NetBox as my inventory source of truth. So um, we're going to pull devices, uh, information from NetBox, so I know like these are the devices I want to go and interrogate. And uh, just to introduce the topic of programming in async, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a library called HTTPX. And so I can just type in uh, the library that I want. You can see the drop down. I click HTTPX and, and click on install package. So a lot of times people would be doing like pip install or create a requirements file. Again, I'm just kind of using the the IDE to install the package that I want. And you can see like all of these packages kind of got pulled in. Yeah, I'm really, uh, really liking this um, IDE, Jeremy. I, <laughs> I, it takes a lot to pull me away from VS Code, but wow, this, this is really nice under the hood and you don't have to worry about your pip install or any of that, incredible. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to do another, uh, I'm going to show, we're going to cover a lot of things, a lot of Jeremy, you know, things he's learned over the 10 years that he's been programming in Python, um, the libraries I like to use and such. So one of them is called python.env. And what this allows me to do is, is pull in credentials or really read a file that is just like variable name equals value. And then that automatically puts it into my environment. And this is a good way for, you know, uh, secrets that I don't want to like, you know, copy and paste or, or whatnot. So that's, that's Python uh, env. And so let's, let's just start with that and, and kind of get started. So I'm going to create a new Python file here called uh, find Mac address, find Mac address. You have to type in PY, so here we are. Now, what I wanna do is I want to create an asynchronous Python client to talk to, to, to NetBox. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna import HTTPX. And so for, I'm gonna- For anybody maybe, so that async, meaning you wanna, you don't wanna wait for responses. You wanna send out what you need. And then when, it, once it's been gathered and it's ready, it will come back to you, but not, you're not waiting. It's, it's asynchronous, right? Yeah. I'm, I'll, I'll cover, you know, what is async I okay. mean and how does it manifest, you know, in a program uh, just a sec, but, it, right. but there is this nature of, you know, waiting and not waiting um, and concurrency. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Now, okay. what I want to do is I uh, also want to import, um, you know, from, uh, uh, hi, let's see, what is it? Uh, from uh, .env import uh, load.env. And what that function does is that will allow me to read a file worth of um, my variables that I'm gonna need, for example, my NetBox URL and my, net, my NetBox token. So here's how I go about doing this. I'm gonna define a class called NetBox client, which is going to uh, be a subclass of this thing called an HTTP async client. Now, um, if you're familiar with the requests library and sessions, this is kind of a similar concept. You know, the idea is, is I want to have an instance of a client that I'm going to maybe use for quite a bit. So I just don't want to use the raw, you know, async client get put, you know, post. I want to create uh, something that wraps around that. So I have uh, a session or an instance. In this case, it's called a client. Now, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to initialize this client. 
And the way that I would do that, you know, this initializer is anything from async client. Now, async client takes um, a base URL, uh, a base URL. So that's going to be essentially every time I run, you know, get or post, I won't have to repeat the base URL over and over again. Now that base URL is going to come from an environment variable uh, called netbox URL. So I'm going to first uh, load a file that has all my credentials and these variables in it. And so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a standard uh, Python library called pathlib. So I'm going to reference it. Uh, from, uh, oops, from pathlib path. I'm going to say uh, path. What I want to do is from a file called demo env, uh, I want to uh, expand that uh, out so that, you know, expand to a little tilde so I don't have to remember where my home directory is. And uh, then I'm going to, this is going to be the, the path. So that's going to, that's going to load the contents of that file. And then um, I am going to, uh, from OS import environment, which is how I'm going to pull my environment variable. And here I'm going to say, I'm going to use an F string to say from the environment, use netbox URL slash API slash. So that means, you know, I'm, I'm going to go pull from my, my netbox API. And uh, I am not going to use any kind of SSL verification. So I'm going to say false here. And then um, what I also want to do is I want to set the uh, token for authorization. So I'm going to say headers. And here I'm just going to say is a dictionary for authorization. And that value is, uh, again, an F string called token and environment netbox token. So that is going to initialize essentially my async client uh, when I create an instance of that. Uh, any questions so far? No, I, I follow along. I think this is this is good, and it's okay. um, so, secure so as well, right? Yeah. So let's run a little demo, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna introduce async IO now. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make a little function called main, and uh, I'm gonna say I want Netbox to be an instance of my Netbox client, and then I'm going to uh, let's say I want to get some devices. So I'm gonna say nd dot get. Uh, oops, get. Right, and here, uh, if you're familiar with Netbox, for all the Netbox users out here, I'm gonna pull from the DCIM devices endpoint. And let's say I want to uh, pass the parameters for a site. So let's say in my use case, I want to look at devices that are in my uh, New York uh, office headquarters. And in this case, we know that the role associated to these devices that we wanna look at are our layer two edge, you know, where, you know, users plug in. So we have a role defined for our devices called uh, L2 switch wired. And uh, the next thing that I want to do is uh, this. And then the next thing I wanna do is I wanna say uh, limit is zero, meaning I wanna pull back all of the devices all at once because by default, um, Netbox will return 50 records and at most a thousand. But in this case, I know that I have less than a thousand of these. I have somewhere around 200 plus. Now you'll notice that I get the squiggly thing and the squiggly thing is like, okay, what's up with that? And it says coroutine is not awaited. Okay. And what this means is when you use async IO in, in Python, there's these new keywords. One is async to mean that this is an asynchronous function. And then you have to await to actually get the results. So normally, if you didn't have async going on here, you would just have def main, and this would be netbox get. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm doing one function. This really doesn't lend itself well to the construct of, uh, you know, why would you use async IO? But I just want to demonstrate, you know, we can pull from the API and it works. Okay. Um, at this point, this is going to be my result, which is going to be an HTTPX uh, result construct. And uh, what I'm going to do just for grins is I'm going to uh, make a dummy variable here and I'm going to put a breakpoint here. Now, 
I'm going to use uh, PyCharm to run code and set a breakpoint so that I can actually look at variables and inspect them. So to do that, I'm going to, this is called add configuration. I'm going to say, I've got a Python uh, program I want to run. I'm just gonna call this, you know, find Mac, just to give it a name. And the script that I want it to run, uh, it'll pop up here. And here's find Mac address. So I'll click open. And I'm going to also say emulate terminal and output console because if I want to you know, print things to the screen or get user input, which I will in a minute, I'm going to turn that on. Okay. Now uh, I have to actually run main, right? And in order to do that, uh, you can't just say main because again, at, at this point, main is a coroutine. And so you have to tell uh, Python to run it you know, as an asynchronous process. So to do that, We'll say import async IO and we'll say async IO dot run. And that's what is going to, you know, just run this, run this function here or coroutine. Okay. Any questions? No, I, I follow along. I think this is great. I had a more of a comment. And the question okay. is, um, let's say someone is using request.get. Would you like this looks like it's easy enough to refactor in? And make those, you know, synchronous requests into async. Is that does that sound appropriate? Yeah, the eight the, the the developers or the 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 folks who write HTTPX, their goal was to make the user or the programming API consistent with the um, requests, or at least fu functionally equivalent. So, you know, if you're familiar with writing anything with, with requests. For the most part, everything is "quote unquote" the same with HTTPX. Right. Like I see the dot get, and it would look like instead of you know request dot get, I would just need to put a wait in front of it and then make it an async dot run. That that's very very powerful. Very good. Okay. So now up here, I can either run the program or I can run it with a debugger. And the, and the reason I'm going to run it with the debug is so we can kind of stop at this breakpoint. Hit the breakpoint, right? Yeah. So I'm going to click that button. And uh, it says connected to debugger. And now I see that it stopped here and I can look at my response and it says, right. you know, response is 200 is okay. And I can actually look at, you know, what, what the data is. You know, I can see that the text looks like some uh, JSON here. So I know that this is all right. And I know that I'm talking to my uh, netbox. Your netbox. Yeah. So uh, at this point, I'm going to stop my debugger. And uh, I'm going to say uh, devices is equal to result, JSON uh, result, because I happen to know that is, you know, what I need to pull out of that response. And now I have, you know, these are my devices that I want to eventually interrogate, right? And uh, again, if I wanted to just, you know, do that again, I'm gonna see how many devices I have. I have 205 devices, right? Okay, now all of these devices are Arista devices. Uh, so I'm gonna simplify our, our kind of example here because they're all, they're all Arista and I'm, I'm not gonna try to show the techniques for dealing in a multi-vendor environment, although that might be a great topic for another time. Uh, but in order to talk to Arista devices over uh, asynchronous API, I'm gonna install a new package. I'm going to install a package called AIO eAPI. Uh, which I wrote <laughs> because one of the things about async IO kind of the, the challenge getting started with async IO is that once you open the genie bottle of async IO, then everything has to be async IO. You can't intermix synchronous and asynchronous things together. So let's take a moment to talk about what that really means. Uh, asynchronous IO in, in, in Python under the hood, way, way deep down in the details is really the same as back in the day in Unix socket programming. The idea of that there's this select function where you give it a bunch of sockets and you just say, wait for somebody to do something and then wake up and then process whatever that was. And that all happens in a single process or a single thread, if you wanna think about it in terms of processes or threads. So to, to achieve concurrency in async IO, we're just gonna open up a whole bunch of sockets to a whole bunch of devices, you know, 
concurrently. And then as data comes back from all these devices, you know, uh, we're, these tasks that we're gonna be running or these coroutines will kind of fire, wake up and we process them. So we're not doing multi-threading. Multi-threading is another approach for doing concurrency, uh, but we don't have to you know, deal with threads and the heavyweight nature of threads right. and uh, debugging a thread in pro a multi-threaded program is very challenging. So I like using async IO because you get the benefits of concurrency without the trouble of the debugging, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the trouble with uh, debugging multi-threaded programs. And then there are some programming challenges that, you know, come from multi-threaded programs that I, I really won't get into here. But uh, so I'm going to stop blathering on. And but, it, but you're you're eliminating the needle in a stack of needles problem here, right? With without you know, searching for the thread that's doing your your coroutine down deep, right? Right. Like so, for example, there's a popular um, you know framework called Nornir, which you know I used for for a while, um, and it's a multi-threaded environment. And so that means like, for example, if I wanted to go talk to a hundred devices, it would spin up a hundred threads. But if I wanted to set a breakpoint and try to debug something, it was kind of challenging to do that. Okay. Um, not impossible, you know, it's a great okay. library for, for what it is. And, you know, at the, you know, I'd also want to say, you know, look, if you're using a library, whether it's Nornir or, uh, you know, you like Ansible, there's no right or wrong, you know, thing. If it works for you, you know, I always say, if it feels good, do it. You know, if it works right. for you, do that. But, you know, you yourself, you know, you've gone through this kind of journey of I used to use Ansible and now I'm using PyTS and now I'm like writing some hardcore Python code. So, you know, everybody's on a journey. They'll, they'll kind of do things as they need to. And what, I, what I'm doing this tutorial is to just show people another way to do concurrency in, in network uh, applications and use cases, because I think it's a very common problem or a, or a very common use case. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, now I wanna go talk to a device. You know, I've got these device records, which gives me the IP addresses and so forth. So now I'm going to um, go from uh, AIO EAPI import device. Now device is again, a class definition, which also, you know, is just another fancy async uh, client. And so I'm going to make a class called uh, finder and it's gonna inherit from device. And what I'm going to do here is uh, rather than, you know, provide all of these async IO, uh, you know, parameters here, which I don't need to do, I'm going to pass it um, a device record, which is a dictionary. And that's gonna be the dictionary record from NetBox, meaning I'll know its IP address, I'll know its role, I'll know its host name, you know, all the bits and pieces that I get from NetBox, you know, from these records, I'm gonna pass that in. I'll fix the squiggly in just a sec. And then what I wanna do is uh, I wanna then invoke the device, this device constructor. And if I hit, I think it's Alt J, nope, Control J. Yeah, if I hit Control J again, you know, this is gonna be, uh, this is gonna get you the documentation about, um, you know, this device. And I think if I hit init, and hit wow. control J, J, oops, control J again, you know, it'll show you the device. You know, if I had, if I had documented this, it, it just, it tells you what it's supposed to be doing here. So uh, you can see that, uh, let's see if, if I hit control or meta and then click on device, it'll actually jump me to this device. And you can see that I can pass in host, username, password, protocol, port, or any arguments that go to this async client. Now, uh, so this is the code for you know, this particular library. Now I wanna call your attention to this thing called auth. Auth is currently set to none, but in this code, what this does is it says, if you provide me an auth, I'll use it. If you, uh, if you don't provide me an auth you know, in these parameters, then I'll use whatever the class has defined as the auth. Or if you provide me username and password, I'll create a basic auth. Basic, cool. Now, here's a, here's a cool trick uh, or a technique. Uh, because I have this, what I can do is I can set an auth to a uh, basic auth because you know, when I log into all of these network devices, they're all gonna use the same basic auth, right? They're all the same username and password. Right. So I don't need to 
create an authentication instance, you know, 500 times or 200 times, I'll just do it once. So I'll just say username, and this comes from my environment uh, network right. username, and then uh, password is equal to environment uh, network password. So uh, now I don't have to provide it because this device class is going to be looking for this auth property. And this is a class attribute, uh, not a instance attribute. Okay. So I do know that I need to provide the host variable, which is which would either be the IP address or the host name uh, of, of the device. Now I'm running this on my laptop, so I don't have DNS to all these devices. Right, so right. I'm going to have to use the IP address that comes from this device record. So uh, I like to create little helpers. Uh, and this is something I'm going to call IP adder. And so I'm going to say return self device. I'm going to keep a copy of device. And I know that's a device record that has a primary IP address. And I want to split that based on the slash because I know it includes the, the subnet mask. So that's going to return me just back the IP address. So I could say now self IP adder. And uh, that's good. And I'll do the same technique for uh, host name, which is just the name of the uh, netbox device. Okay. Now what I'm doing here is called a type annotation. So this program knows, or this piece of code knows that this device is a dictionary. And to uh, let the system know that, I'll say from typing import dict. I like using I like using type annotations. It's, it's kind of a modern feature of Python. So this is basically giving me my, my IP address. And at this point, I should be able to actually do a call uh, and do something with a device, I think. So let's, let's kind of validate that theory. So I'm gonna say uh, dev is a finder and I'm gonna just uh, pick my first device, right? And dev has a CLI function. So CLI basically lets me run any CLI. So I'll do show version. Okay. Again, we're seeing that this is telling me that this is a coroutine. So I have to await the response. All right. And then I'll put a breakpoint here. Let's see what we get. Click run with debug. Okay. Uh, I have a device that's finder. And oh, wow. I and I have a response and I'm looking in here and I can see that it's showing me, and I don't know if this is big enough. So I'm I can trying see to make the this, version. Yeah, yeah, it's You there. can see like, it, this is all the data that's in there. So I can, I can just kind of look at it and I can see that all the data is in here. So I know that the, you know, this information is correct. Now, as much as I love Arista and EOS, which I do, not all of their commands return uh, structured JSON or dictionary output. Okay. So in, in some cases, you might just want to set the uh, output format to text. Oh, cool. And uh, so I've run into cases where this is true. Um, so we can just, you know, I'll just stop this and rerun it from scratch. And uh, now what we'll see is that the response is a text string here, right? It's just a string. So if I wanted to look at that, I could actually highlight the variable and go evaluate expression. And if I wanted to, I could say print, print this value. And if I click evaluate, you're like, huh, where did it go? Well, it's in the console. So here, right. so I'll kind of move this off to the side. So you can kind of see like, here's the console, my console output, you know, if I wanted to, right? It's wow. Kind of yeah. So, um, but I'm going to leave it like this. Now, what we want to do is we want to find a MAC address, right? You know, that's the whole goal here. So let's say I uh, make a function or uh, a coroutine called find MAC adder. And we're going to give it a MAC address to find. Now, Normally people would say, look, well, I want, it, you know, I think MAC address should just be a string. Well, the challenge with MAC addresses is that everybody has, you know, every vendor has a different format. Some use, you know, two octets with a colon, some use four octets with a dot. And it's really kind of aggravating and annoying to deal with. So what does Jeremy do? He writes a library to deal with it. 
And so there's a library called Mac Adder. And what this allows me to do is to take a Mac address and then ask for a format and it, it does the right thing, right? So just by way of example, if I were to uh, get some data or show some data about a MAC address on EOS, and I am going to do that, let's, let's do this uh, a fun way. Let's do uh, show MAC uh, address table that will get all the MAC addresses. I think that's true. I think that's the right command. It, get is, all of them. it is on my on Cisco. I'm not, I can't speak to Arista, but I believe it is. Okay. So let's do that. And the other thing is, is this might take more, this might take more time than the default amount uh, that's allotted for HTTP requests. Okay. Uh, you know, by default, the timeout is I think five seconds. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to allow the caller, i.e. me, to pass any uh, HTTPX parameters, like say what I want the timeout to be, and I'll just pass those as they are. So what I could do is I could say finder and then timeout right. is equal to 60. And this way, if this takes a long time to get me that back, but let's do this. Let's uh, run this with debug, see what we get. And uh, we have this thing called multicast tables is zero and unicast tables is a dictionary that has table entries and, there's your Macs and then and there's wow. a list and then we can see these are all the Mac addresses. Okay. So then we could say, well, what if we wanted to look for a Mac address? Uh, let's, let's copy that value. And I just wanted to look for that address. Right. All right. So I'll just kind of drop that in there. So if we did that, you know, what would that look like? Um, so I don't know if I can do this, but let's try this. I'm going to highlight this whole thing and say, evaluate this expression and then click evaluate. Ah, you can't do an await, uh, in, oh, this, in this pie charm. Okay. That's so we good. learned something. All right. We'll, we'll click debug again. Let this run. And now we have a response. Singular Mac, right. And we'll have a list. You can see that it, this says, uh, this is a list of dictionary, you know, this table entries. And we can see table entries as a list of one, you know, so we can see like what this looks like, right? Oh, okay. just to, maybe just to highlight this. So that all of what we're looking at is sitting in response, correct? Right, like we That's can, correct. Then, we can take yep. that and do, whatever we want with it, make a CSV file, send it to a printer, send it to a front end, right? Whatever, whatever, whatever we want, right? Whatever we want, right, right. What we want, you know, so we're looking at this is like, okay, well, what is the data we want? Well, you know, uh, we wanna know the interface it came in on, right? So we, we know we want interface. Let's say that we want the VLAN that it was also on. That's probably pretty important. Let's just say that we want those two properties. So we're gonna, we're gonna basically pull out this response and store out those two values. So let's move this function, right? Let's move this here, put this called find MAC address. Okay. So let's do this uh, from MAC adder import MAC address. That's that's my, our, our helper class for Mac, dealing with MAC addresses. <laughs> so uh, now I'm gonna say, uh, take that MAC address, whatever we want, and uh, stick it here and make this an F string. And this is gonna be self since we're uh, a device object. So that's how we're going to get that back out. Now uh, we know, let's just say that we, we know that uh, Arista wants this in a uh, two column format, right? There's two octets colon format. Now that happens to be the default for Mac adder but let's just kind of show you an example. Let's say that I set the, uh, the MAC address, just a sample of a MAC address to, you know, aabb.ccdd.eeff, right? And now um, I, I turn that into, I say, give me that MAC address, right? So a user can put it in any format that they want. Right. Right, so I'll put a breakpoint here and we'll kind of run through this. 
So now I have this thing called a MAC address. And if I wanted to evaluate this, and I said, okay, well, format that. And I say, evaluate it. It's going to show to you as AA colon BB colon CC PDEEFF, for example. Or if I wanted to say, I want it to be, uh, you know, I want the, the size of the octet groups to be four and the separators to be dashes, for example. You know, what does that look like? Evaluate. You can see, like, I can yeah. manipulate this any way. The other kind of cool thing about the Mac adder is that it caches that value. So if I ask for that format 100 million times, it's only going to compute it once. Again, very handy when you're dealing with, I need to go look for something on a bunch of devices over and over again. So, you know, in the case of Arista, you know, what I would do is, is I would say, what I want is the MAC address, you know, let's say a fine MAC or uh, EOS MAC is going to be MAC adder format, you know, size is two and SEP is colon. Now, again, format, that's the default parameters for format, but if I wanted to be very explicit about it, right. that's what I would do. Okay. All right, so now that I've run that command, I know that what I wanna get out is the, the tabular data uh, that we showed in the, um, let's see, where did I have that before? I'll tell you what, I'm going to log into a device because it's gonna be faster and easier. Pick one of my devices. Kind of what I end up doing. Uh, all right, so let's do show Mac address table and we'll pick one. Find one that's got uh, Ethernet on it. Yeah, I was going to see you pipe them. Yeah, all that. right. So let's do show Mac address table address this value and we'll, we'll just dump this to JSON. So we can see that. You know, we have this unicast table and, and these table entries. I also want to know, like, well, what happens if I type in something that doesn't exist? Right? Well, it has to be a, a valid MAC address. And if we do pipe that to JSON, we can see that there are no table entries. But we know the structure of this. Right. So what this means is I can say, um, you know, MAC entries is going to be equal to our response. And then... Um, I'm going to say unicast table. Right, right. And table entries. Okay. So that's going to be a list. It's always going to be a list, but there may or may not be any entries in it. Right. Okay. So the next thing I want to do is, is well, what do I want to do with these MAC entries? Well, I want to kind of keep them around because I'm going to need them later, maybe, right? Now, this is only going to be, it should only be one entry because I'm looking for a specific MAC address. Right, but um, we'll see about that. You know that we might have a different use case, so we'll kind of leave this as it is, format this differently. So now I want to have a thing called you know Mac entries, which we're going to default as a list. Actually, we can default it as none. Uh, and so what we're going to do is is we're going to look at this thing and we're going to say, well, if that is uh, if there's nothing there, then we have nothing to do, and so. Why we don't we return? Anything. Yeah, right. so we can say, um, now this is a feature of Python 3.8. I can say if MAC addresses, which is equal to that, you know, if, if there's, there's nothing there, then I'm going to say return none. Right, so I'm doing an assignment inside a conditional. For all the C programmers out there, this is something that C programmers do all the time, but this little walrus operator. This is new in Python 3.8. So I'm very happy they put it in there because otherwise I'd have to like, you know, write a few more statements and I just like this better now. Yeah. So I, I'm really, this is piqued my interest. So you're not, you don't have to say, you know, if um, whatever in table entries and, and iterate through, you just do this walrus thing. Very cool. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the normal, the traditional way you do this, you say set a variable, and then you say, you know, if not Mac entries, do this. 
And you're like, okay, well, you're saving a line of code. There's there's other reasons, you know, and there's some other benefits of using the Walrus operator, but I thought it'd be a good thing to introduce, you know. Yeah, no, I appreciate that a lot. I All right. Now, let's say, you know, we have these MAC addresses. So now we have MAC addresses and we'll say, okay, well, self MAC addresses is equal to MAC addresses. It should be one, um, but maybe it's not. Like maybe we get multiple MAC addresses because, you know, it's going to show up on a port channel that's an uplink port, right? So now what we really want to do is we want to say, well, we're really looking for host address. And so in my network, I know that the host address has to be on an Ethernet port, uh, right? Let me go back to picking an actual valid one. So here I can see, you know, the interface. So I'm like, okay, right, I want so, to make sure. Right, interface right, I want to make start sure with Ethernet, not port channel or tunnel interface or whatever, right? That's right. So really what I want to do is, is I want to loop through all my table entries and find only ones where the interface starts with ETH. So what I really want to do here then is I want to say, um, you know, Mac entries is equal to, now I'm going to loop through everything in this table, which it might be an empty table and that's okay. So I'm going to say, you know, for entry in this, you know, uh, if the entry interface starts with uh, ETH, then that's okay. That's and we'll keep right. it, right? And, um, and then we want to say, well, you know, if we don't have any of those, you know, then we're going to, you know, return. On. Okay. So far, so good. And I might just uh, format that. Okay. So that's, uh, that's a bit of code there. It's doing a lot of work in kind of one line. You know, this is called a, 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 com a uh, compression or I can't, I can never get that word right. But, you know, doing, doing a for loop inside a list, this is basically creating a list. Okay. Now at this point, we have Mac entries. Probably should be only one, but I'm just going to store it all there just to be safe. And now what do I want to return? Do I want to return the Mac entries? No, I do not. What I wanna do is I wanna return self. And the reason is, is because as I'm going through all these devices, I'm gonna see whether or not the device found something. And if it found something, I'm gonna store what it found and I'm gonna return myself so that I now have context to the thing that found my MAC address. So I wanna know like, well, what device is it on? And I might wanna know other things about it. So rather than just returning the fact that I got MAC addresses, I wanna know about where it came from or the context. So- right. So now I want to be specific about what I'm going to return here. And so what I'm saying is, is I want to return an optional um, finder. So uh, optional basically is a word that says, okay, optional says I may or may not be returning a class called finder. Now, why did I put this in quotes? Okay, this is a good question. If I don't put it in quotes, what happens is, because this is being declared as part of a class, which has yet to be completely declared at the time this gets type compiled or type evaluated, it doesn't know about Finder. Right. But if you put it in quotes, then the, the Python linting system actually knows that what you're returning back is in fact a Finder. You only have to do this thing, like this quote thing, when the, the, the type that you're referencing hasn't been fully declared yet. It's, a, it's kind of a weird thing. I think there's a way to turn some flag on where the type linter is more, more smarter, but this is the technique that I know. Okay, so now we have find MAC address. Okay, so now we should be able to do this. We should be able to say, I've got um, a device and I've got a MAC address. So let's kind of you know, pick one. Right. Uh, so we'll pick this one. Right. And so I'm on this device called LX5V01. So let's let's just test that out. Let's say, you know, I'm going to say, you know, this device is going to be, um, you know, for uh, dev in devices. If dev name is equal to uh, LX. 5e01 so then give me that device 
And then I'm going to say next. OK, I'm going to unpack this for you in a minute. <laughs> this is a, a cheap way of saying, look through this list of things for a matching criteria, and then uh, give me that thing, right? So, so if you don't put next here, what this actually turns out to be is a generator. Uh, and a generator is, is not a list. Like if I wanted to make it a list, I could make it a list like this. Right, right. Right. And then I could say this device sub zero. I could, I could do this. Right. That's equivalent. Um, but, you know, if you like using generators, I'll, I'll do this because uh, this is probably, this probably makes a lot more sense to most people uh, if they haven't dealt with generators. Uh, so I'll just leave it like this. So now I have uh, this device. Okay. And now I want to say uh, await, uh, uh, await dev find MAC address, this MAC address. Okay. And uh, let's put a breakpoint here and let's run with the debugger, see what happens. Okay. Do we have found? Found actually returns uh, a non none value, right? So we have found, and if we look at MAC address, MAC address entries, we can see that we actually found, you know, found that entry. Just for say, just for giggles, let's let's change this to you know nine. And right. Once again, do a not found, right? Right. And what we'll find is is that uh, found is none. Wow. Okay. Bravo, Pretty cool. Jeremy. Bravo. <laughs> Okay, so, all right, so that's one device. Now, how do we do it for all the devices? And this right. is now where we get into the, the fun bits. Okay, now what you gotta know is what find MAC address is a coroutine, uh, which means it's something that can be awaited upon, right? And that is what Python would call a awaitable. Much like there are iterables, like a list is an iterable, there are things that are awaitable, which means you can await them. Okay. Now, when you want to await something, you can await one thing at a time, or for the purpose of multi, you know, concurrency, you want to wait, await a whole bunch of things. So let's say I wanted to run this one command on the first 10 devices, right? So let's get rid of this. And let's say, uh, you know, first 10 devices is going to be devices zero to 11, right? So that's gonna give me just the first set of devices. So now uh, what I wanna be able to do is I wanna say, um, you know, finders is going to be, I'm gonna make a list of, of, you know, for every one of my, you know, these guys. Go find you know, that, right. For uh, dev and this, you know, I'm going to make a bunch of finders. So now I have a whole bunch of these devices, essentially, that I want to go find things on. And now what I want to do is I want to create a bunch of coroutine tasks, which are going to, you know, go and call find MAC address for each of those. So I'm going to, I'm going to refer to these as tasks because that's how Python refers to them. But this is, just a, this is again, just a list. And I'm going to say um, dev you know, for uh, dev or, yeah, I'm just gonna say dev in finders. Now I'm gonna say um, dev find MAC address, MAC address. Now what that would do is that would create a list of coroutines, which I would then have to, you know, uh, call await on, which I'm going to do, right? So now that I have a whole bunch of tasks, how do I run them concurrently? Well, the way you do that is I can say, uh, I'm gonna say results is equal to async IO. There's a couple of different ways to do this. I'm gonna show you both of them. One is called gather. Gather basically takes a comma separated list of coroutines to run. So that would be like, you know, X comma Y comma Z, you know, comma, right. comma D. Let's say that we had four coroutines we want, but I've got a list. So how do you take a list and convert it into a comma separated thing in Python? There's, there's what's called the flat operator. So you just put it in front of like a list and that will flatten it out to a bunch of comma separated things. So that's, that's what this flatter is doing. Now this is an awaitable, so I actually have to await that. Okay. 
So far, so good? Yeah. Okay, let's hit the debugger and see what we get. Now, since we have 10 of these finders, what we should get back is a results structure that has 10 items in them, uh, or 11, since I can't count. And you can see it found it on one, but none, 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 didn't find it on any of the others, right? It just so happens that the first device hey, we got lucky. Yeah. To be this well, no, it right. just happens to be that way. But let me let me take another one just to be uh, let me on the on the seventh floor of our building. Uh, let's go find one. Show Mac address. Uh, yeah, there's no Ethernet ones in here, really. So. Well, you're looking for a MAC address, Jeremy. If, um, let's say, I don't know, number six on that list, let's say you went across to the West Coast over some poor link, or you know what I mean? If there's some latency involved, or, or it's a massive MAC address table, and it takes longer than steps two, three. You know, like, do, are each of these coming back to you at their own pace? Are they all sort of staged and queued? Is it serial or parallel? Uh, let me answer that question, but let me find let me find one. Sure, yeah, no, no problem. I'm just looking at the list and thinking about the world yeah, that, of networks no. that we deal with, right? Some some devices have very big Mac tables or maybe are on poor performing links or across the country. I have some devices up in Yellowknife, <laughs> you know, that right, I have to reach right, out. Right. And... Oops. Uh... I guess there's a lot, not a lot of people in the office today. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, here we go. All right, let's pick, let's pick another one. Uh, in here. Okay, so you'll notice, I just, I mean, this is an interesting thing. I was just you'll gonna say, yeah, Arista, it's not the same format, yeah. Right, but it should work just fine. So let's run this. And you know what, the first 10 devices, it may not actually find any, right. because that device might not be in the first 10. Oops, uh, where's results? You can see that it's all none. None, right, right. right. Okay, so let's, let's actually just use all the devices, right? Why limit ourselves? Let's just do them all. Now, uh, I want you to carefully watch uh, this process. So it's sitting here and it's now going over 200 devices looking for something, right? And so I have results, I have 205 results and somewhere in here, I've I probably found, I've probably found, it here we right, go. There it is, okay. Right, there it is. Now, uh, and then it continues to look. Now, you asked the question, you know, what's going on behind the scenes. Essentially, imagine you had, in this case, 205 CCIEs, and they all logged in all at once, and they all did the show command, and whoever found the MAC address first raises their hand and says, I got it, we're done, right? So the, the latency question is a function of this timeout. Now, we're not running, when we run the command, we're running the command on EOS, so we have to presume, well, EOS is smart enough if we give it a single MAC address, it's not dumping the entire table. It's just, you know, looking for that right. one thing. Maybe it's looking it up on the cam. We don't know. But the latency about going back and forth across uh, something like Yellowknife, for example, and I happen to know where that is, uh, you know, that's where you would set this timeout value. And maybe you set that timeout value based on, you know, the location of the device. So maybe if you say, well, this device is in Yellowknife, I'm going to make this timeout you know, 120 seconds, you know, and you can be more intelligent about the parameters that you pass to the async IO client. Wonderful. Now, now the thing is, is when you do, when you want to do something and talk to a bunch of devices all at once, and there's this dead period of time, your, your user doesn't like that. The user is like, is it hung? Is it broken? I don't like that. Right. So in programming, um, in programming world, there's a, there's a, there's a, something called stroking the user. That's where you get a little progress bar. And yeah. So, yeah. So I just wanted to say one of the first things feedback I got from my users was, um, could you add a spinner or something when while yeah. that's process? And it was like yeah. immediate response. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to show you how I go about doing that. There's, there's two things that we're going to do rather than using gather, because what gather does is it says, I'm going to wait until I've completed all of these tasks. Okay. Right. Before it returns you the result. 
we're going to use something else called um, another async IO function called as completed. So we're going to say, you know, for task oh, cool. item in async IO um, as completed. And in this case, you can give it a list. And note that I'm not doing an await here because what you have to do is you have to say the response is equal to the, you await the task item. This is a nuance of how this mechanism works. It's a little okay. odd until you use it a million times, but what you're doing is, is this is giving you back the awaitable and this is giving you back it, the result. It, right. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. just for the networking folks, I, I can see a clear use case of say gather um, an IP address, which might show up across the board. And we actually want to see that IP across every device and go gather them all. A MAC address, in theory, in theory, you should, once we find it, I don't, you know, every other response I don't care about because I've already found it, right? Is that the idea here, Jeremy? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, you can do this solely for the purpose of, I want to let the user know things are happening, right? Right. Even if you're going to wait for them all to complete. So let's do that. I see. So there's another library I like to use called a live progress. So I'm going to use a live progress. It's just a progress bar package. There's many out there. This just happens to be the one I like. Um, they all kind of work in a similar way. So I'm going to say uh, from the live progress, import a live bar. And uh, LiveBar has all these gadgets and widgets. I'm going to use the most simplest thing. Um, I'm going to say uh, with a live bar total is equal to the length of tasks that I have as bar. My bar. You know, as things are done, I'm going to uh, basically Progress tell bar, bar to update. Right? Wow. And, um, and now I'm going to say response is equal to this. Now response, remember what response is going to give me. That's going to give me either none or the, result. The, the place where I found it, where I actually found it on an Ethernet port. Presumably, this would be only be one place, but, you know, we'll see. So let's do this. We'll say, uh, you know, found on devices is going to be a list. And we're going to say um, if... If there is a response, then uh, add it to um, this to found, just to be consistent with what I've done before. So if it was found, then then add it to that list of devices. And uh, then we'll set a breakpoint and we'll see what that list looks like. Pretty good. All right. Hey, let's, cool. uh, let's just hit run. In this case, I don't need to, well, yeah, no, let's hit the debugger. OK, I'll hit the debugger. And now what we should see uh, is when this is running, let's see, mm. there it goes. There we so go. there is the little progress bar. It's going boom and it's done. Okay, <laughs> so that, that, that was like 200 and some odd devices. So found on devices is a list of one as we hoped it would be. And uh, we can see exactly uh, you know, where it was found and where is map back address entries. We can see that uh, here's the interface. It was found on that port uh, on this VLAN. Okay, cool. But we still uh, we still went around and we're like, well, crap. I, I looked at 205 devices, but I don't want to look at 205 devices. If I found it. I should just stop, right? Right. Like, why bother with it? Okay. Now I'm going to do something, and it's not going to work the way it's going to it's going to yak. And I expect this, but I want to show people this so that I can show you how you deal with it. So let's say that if we find it, we're done. We're going to break out of this loop, right? So basically it says, once I find it, <laughs> that's I found, it. I'm done. Break out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, right. So let me, let me just click run. I want to do a break, uh, a debugger, but what's going to happen is there's going to be, it's going to find it at some point. Boom. Okay. So it found it, like I'll scroll back up. This is what I want yeah. everybody to see. Yeah, you triggered the find. Uh, so I, I found it right. on the 79th device. Now, what this is saying is I have a whole bunch oh. of devices that I haven't closed yet. So when I when I open up an async connection with HTTPX, I actually have to close it. Right. right. So they're like a bunch of dangling threads at this point. Right. So the way we go about doing that is we could just say, 
using our async IO gather, we could just say- um, Oh, shut him down, cool. Yeah, we could just say, um, uh, you know, for uh, dev in finders, what we want to do is, is we want to do uh, dev a close is actually the HTTPX, you know, uh, gracefully for closing close this it. connection. Right, right. Yeah. And so we're going to just await that. So this is just going to, you know, close out all the HTTPX async. So let's run that again and see what happens. Oh, oh we still got some errors. Okay, Those so now what's errors. up with this? So now we've got all of these tasks that were, we said, hey, we, we're waiting for stuff and we never right. told the system to not wait for it. So we get all these errors saying, hey, I'm waiting for I'm something, still but waiting. I'm still waiting and this is not good. So now what we uh. have to do, we have to basically have a mechanism to tell Python to cancel the tasks and we don't really care about it anymore. Now to do that, we have to take this awaitable coroutine, which is what this is, and we have to turn it into a task, right? Because a task is something we can cancel. Just like, you know, a thread is something you can stop and cancel. So there's something called uh, uh, async IO uh, create task. And what this does, I don't know what that is. So what this does is this, instead of making a bunch of coroutines, it makes a bunch of tasks that I can later cancel. Deal with, right. Right. Uh, and what create task does is not only does it create the coroutine, but it puts it on the event loop for processing. So the, the, the fact of me doing this is basically putting it on, you know, putting it on the, for, for processing. Now, what I wanna do is uh, after I've closed down all these sockets, now I want to, you know, cancel, cancel the all tasks. the tasks. Yeah. So now what I can do is I can say, you know, for uh, task in tasks, task cancel, and that's going to cancel the tasks. All right. So now we can run run this again. Boom, 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 boom. And it's done. Uh, and there's one warning left. So maybe I should do one before the other. I can never remember that. I see. Cancel the tasks and then close and then out close the. Them. Yeah. Right. Probably something like that. Do, 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 do. Uh, for details. Or, is there, or, or are you trying to close the task that is successful? Is it like because there's one well, error? Is this yeah, because there's. You can you can do that. It's okay to cancel tasks that have already been run. So it, it's kind okay. of a no-op in that case. Okay. All right. I just see there's one, you know, is it related to the one task that oh. worked? Um, ah, now I remember why. This is Netbox. Oh. Right? So Netbox, this was actually an async client, right? So uh, I would have to do a Netbox A close here. Now, there's another thing you can do. I mean, you, I could do this. I could say, you know, await and be a close, right? Right. But async IO clients uh, have a uh, a with thing. You can say async with uh, as and be, and what that will do is that will open the connection and then close it as it as it leaves that block. Very right? cool. So oh, because you only you're scraping Netbox once to get your populate your device list. You don't need that that anymore after that, right? That's right. So now if I run this, um, that was the thing that wasn't closed. It was my Netbox connection. So we can see, all right, we finished. Now, wow. now that we finished, uh, you know, we'd like to actually look at the results. So uh, let's look at the results. Now to look at the results, I like to uh, use something called tabulate because I want to make like a table of output. Now yeah. I know there's only one, case, one in this case, but you know, Still. we're going to... Still, uh, tabulate. So click tabulate, install package. Okay, done. Done. So we'll say uh, from tabulate uh, import tabulate, and this is a package that you know produces uh, you know text tables. So uh, now I've done that. I want to say my uh, 
table uh, records, which is a list of things, I'm going to say, you know, for um, for each found in uh, found on devices, found on devices, and, and honestly, there should only be one. Right, right, right. And then we're going to say uh, for uh, each Mac in each found uh, Mac address. Uh, or was that Matt? What do we call it? Mac entries, Mac entries, Mac entries. Uh, and it didn't know, it didn't know how to name complete that. Oh, well, the reason why is because I could say this is actually a list of finders. And if I told it what it was, if I add this to list again, type hinting here. Now it should uh, Mac entries, you know, name complete it for me. Again, PyCharm and VS Code probably do that. Now I've got my uh, each found and I've got my each Mac address. So what I really want is for every row in this table, I want uh, each found, each found uh, host name because I want to know the device it was found. And then each Mac, I want, um, well, this happens to be a dictionary right now. And the dictionary happens to be very specific to uh, EOS, right? Remember if we looked at one of these? Right, right. Um, let's do uh, this one. Oh, I, th I don't know if you're on an EOS device anymore, are you? I, I am, I just need oh, to put in keywords. Right, it's very specific to uh, this format. So for now, that's okay. But if I wanted to do a multi-vendor approach, which again, I might show in another day, we might do it differently. I, I would use something called data classes, which would be something differently. But let's do uh, this interface. Oops, we want to say interface. And then we want uh, each. Come on, hands, do this. Each Mac, uh, we want VLAN ID. Okay. So really we have uh, table headings. Table headings is uh, a host name or host, right. I'll just say device, and then uh, interface and uh, VLAN ID. Right. And then we can say uh, print tabulate uh, headers is equal to table headings and tabular data, was it? Tabular uh, data is equal to table records. Okay, so then at this point we should go and see an output. Boink, and there we are. That's where that MAC address happens to be. Great. Oh, oh. wow. Okay. Not ever, in, in, in just a shade over an hour, you've done this, Jeremy. That is, that is really inspiring. Is that ever incredible stuff? Yeah, thanks. I, um, I, I think there's a lot of, of technique in here and, and things to unpack, you know, so hopefully, you know, the goal was rather than, you know, have somebody read through 12 blogs on, you know, how to do this one thing, how to do this other thing, how to, you know, how to deal with async, how you do all these techniques, you know, separately, which is what I do over time. I figure out like, I want to do this thing. How do I, right. know, how do I do it? This is what I would call a recipe, you know, for, you know, building a solution, you know, a practical, a, you know, a practical use case that every, you know, network engineer might have. Now, very quickly, if you if you have the time and you want to see, well, how would we find all of the MAC addresses for a given vendor? Like, say we we're looking for all of our Mitel phones that are connected to the to the network at one time. We can do something very quickly, uh, like a very quick, you know, kind of uh, thing. Which, very similar which, to this. which, by the way, um, is would be and can be an extremely powerful use case for businesses, um, particularly yeah. around asset management and inventory. And uh, we can look at the first half of the MAC address. Yeah, so let's find do that. Every Cisco device, every Mitel, every IBM, every Rico. Yeah, yeah it's really good. This so let's idea. do this. Let's say rather than find MAC address, let's, find, let's do find MAC OUI, right? 
Okay. So um, now we um, are not going to pull a specific MAC address anymore because in this case, we can't. We have to look at the whole table and then filter out based on this MAC address OUI. So not only do we want to, you know, make sure that the interface um, starts with ETH, but we also want to make sure that the MAC address, you know, OUI matches, right? So really what we want is, um, what we want to be able to do is take a MAC OUI. So let's say we have this MAC address. We'll say MAC uh, OUI is equal to MAC address. And now we can say uh, format OUI which is just gonna give me the OUI bits, um, you know, in the Brilliant. format that I want. And in this case, since I know that it's, you know, again, separated colon this way, I would say, you know, size is equal to two and separator is equal to colon. So that's the Mac OUI. And so now I'm gonna say, uh, find Mac OUI, and this will be uh, Mac OUI. Oh. All right, so that's the Mac OUI. Uh, here's Mac, Mac o, OUI. And uh, da, 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 da. so that's just going to be a string, actually. That returns a string. Uh, sorry. Yes, that returns a string. So this is going to be a string. Okay, so then we said this and entry uh, MAC address starts with uh, MAC OUI. MAC OUI. All right. Wow. And if that's the case, then we'll just add it to our entries and pretty much everything else remains the same. So we have the same tasks. And now um, we're not going to break here because we actually want to collect right. everything. So uh, then we have to figure out, like, uh, in my case, what is the MITEL uh, OUI? Uh, um, so I'm going to go to uh, my IP Fabric system, which uh, actually does harvest all of this stuff every night or every time I take a snapshot. So uh, if I can get into my IP Fabric system, I should have written this down in advance. You, if you hit Google, there's uh, OUI lookups, Jeremy, if you don't want to display your fabric to the world. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's do a Mac OUI lookup and uh, Wireshark is a good one and uh, Mitel. And there's a couple of them. I think the one that was, it was this I think one. it's that one. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, that's it for that sure. One. Okay. So let's, um, let's paste that in there. And it really doesn't matter what these octets are because, you know, it's only uh, evaluating the yeah. first half, right? Gotcha. And and just to be absolutely sure uh, that is true, <laughs> just going to uh, double check my work. Bonk. And uh, Mac OUI, uh, I'm going to step, and then I've got Mac OUI, and sure enough, it's there. There you go. Right now, gotcha. uh, this is now this is uppercase, and really what we want is lower. Uh, so I could say uh, two case is string lower. Right. And uh, that would actually make sure that it's in lower case. And I can see now it's going to match up to what I want gotcha. you know, in, in Arista land. Okay. Bonk, 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 bonk. Let's uh, stop this. And now uh, we are going to uh, run this program. And let's see what happens. So now we're going to go through all those 205 devices. And get a table and, of phones back. And, oh. and like, uh-oh, something didn't work. Did you have right. to move those two variables back inside? You, you cut them and move them to the top to do your debugging. Do they have to be moved back down? Nope, 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 nope. So what I do is this is uh, if entry starts with Ethernet and entry starts with Mac OUI. Okay, so here's where we would uh, hit a debugger, bonk. Right, I'm going to put a debugger in there. And that's just going to stop on one of them. And uh, unicast table, MAC address. So that tells me that maybe that wasn't the OUI that we use. 
I thought it might have been. Um, let me go back to. Well, well, do you not have it right there in the CLI, Jeremy? What's that? Zero zero. Just just do that one. Zero eight uh, zero zero. Yeah. After. Show Mac address table eight zero 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 eight. No, it's probably the other one. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Mac OUI lookup. What's the other one? Is it this one? O eight zero 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 F. Hmm. Interesting. Um, well, let me try this one more time. But what I what I mean though, Jeremy, is that you could use that zero eight zero 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 F or whatever that one is there and find yeah. find out what company that is, and then go find those. It doesn't you know it doesn't have to be my top. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, show Mac address table in East. Hmm. Oh, ET, that's why I was doing it wrong. Uh, yeah, here it is. This is a Mitel, okay. 08000F. I'm pretty sure that that's what it is. All right, so what I can do is I will just take uh, one of these, you know, as a reference. So that's kind of our, our reference case, right? Right. Yeah. Right. I found one that will give me everybody else from the same OUI. Yeah. Kind of your, your example. It's like, well, find me, you know, one manufacturer. Now find all the manufacturers that match this. And you can see, like, Wonderful. these are all the ones that, that match that manufacturer, right? You know, and if you want to in seconds, wow, incredible. Yeah, and, and to your point, like this is something that you might do, like for I'm trying to find this this route or what routers have this route that isn't, you know, that's a BGP route. You know, like you can think of all these different combinations of things that you're gonna want to go pull from your network in real time. Yeah, I'd like people to think about that as well. Um, right, a Mac. It's very object oriented. A Mac, you could swap out yeah. a subnet, a mask, a BGP neighbor, an IP, you name yeah. it, an access control list name. Very good, Jeremy. I um, I feel like a harmonica player who's been invited to a Yo Yo Ma concert. I really, I'm, I'm really, <laughs> I am really just, just incredibly um, impressed and appreciative of your time. And um, I really, I, I know I didn't add much here other than you know, kind of prod and poke with questions, but um, this is really inspiring stuff. And, and as everyone watching, as you can see, Jeremy, he, it, if you were to look at the end result on a GitHub repo, it might be overwhelming, but as you can see him develop it, it's, it's one little bit at a time, a little bit of pseudocode, he expresses it as to his intention, and then he turns it into code. And I, I'm really impressed here. I mean, that's, you could open source that today and, and have a new tool for the world. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah, no, I'm glad. I'm glad you know you you were asking questions and poking and prodding because a lot of times you know if it was just me yammering, I wouldn't think you know like, well, why did I do it this way or what is this approach or so. No, I think it's it's great. You know, I really enjoyed having you know having the partnership here. Um, we should do it again on you know another topic or you know if there again, I I, I kind of want to throw this out like I'd like to do this more often. You know, if there's other people you know out in the internet that would like to do something like this. Uh, with me, you know, hit me up on Twitter and we can kind of figure something out. Or of course, John, if you come up with another idea that I can, I can do, I'd love to yeah. do that again. Yeah. I, um, I would love to maybe try the, the reverse. Uh, now my Python is, I don't have the experience level and um, you're, you're going to probably, it might be actually be really worth it for me to, to have you watch me do it and say, you know, that works, but maybe try it this way, or you could do this or do that and uh, maybe show, you know, how I bring what you've just done and bring it into say like a Django web framework, what I've been currently working on over the past couple of weeks. I, yeah. I, I agree. And everybody, Jeremy is, he, he really is a mentor to me and has reached out to me and he's open with his time. And if you want to get involved with Jeremy, uh, you know, I can't speak for him, but reach out to him or reach out to me. Uh, it's, it's a really, it's a community experience together. And uh, 
I have I have so much to take away. I've been I have a little notepad here of things <laughs> that I have to <laughs> steal from today's hour and bring it into my world. So yeah, um, yeah. any any anything else, Jeremy? Maybe that that you want to say or, or talk about? Um, maybe comment on on someone want to refactor to this. Like, have you taken? I assume you didn't start with async, and then maybe right. you had some solutions and had to port them over or migrate them or can you is that is that a difficult process to go through um it will feel uncomfortable for the first time just like learning anything new you know it, it, you right. have to kind of come up to speed on the methodologies and the techniques and when i first started with async io you know there was a series of videos uh done by a, a gentleman who's just expert level and his videos were fantastic and in the in the comment section, when I post this to YouTube, I'll, I'll, I'll point to it, um, you know, okay, but great. again, I sat through, you know, what must have been 40 hours of videos. Yeah. Uh, it, it wasn't, but I mean, but I said, and then, and then that was just the tip of the iceberg. So, you know, my hope with doing a demonstration like this or a tutorial is that it puts the pieces together so people can go, oh, okay, I see, you know, this is a turkey dinner. You know, I see, I see the outcome and now I, I do want to invest the time in learning these little bits and pieces, just probably like when you went into Django, it's like this enormous world of, of, you know, information and complexity and you had to pick at it and pick and choose your, what do you want to learn? And, um, and so like anything, uh, I'm always learning, you know, I've been coding for 10 years. I've, I've been exclusively doing, you know, network automation for 10 years. Like this, this is all I do every day and I'm still <laughs> learning new things or, or relearning things. So, you know, don't think that you have to memorize and remember everything always. Cause you know, I don't, nobody does. And if they tell you that they do, then, you know, that's a little sus to me. <laughs> um, you know, definitely don't get uh, overwhelmed, you know, uh, because it is a journey and uh, there's folks like you and me and other people out there that, you know, uh, are writing blogs or doing video tutorials or are available to, you know, ask questions. So um, no, I think this is great, you know, and again, I just want to reiterate if you're, if you're not doing async today, you know, don't throw away everything that you're doing and go right to it. You know, like if what you're doing works for you, that's great. You know, if Ansible is your solution, use Ansible. If Nornia is your solution, use Nornia. This is just to show you there is another way. This is a this is a more modern way, I should say. You know, Python 3.8 really was the version of code I waited for, for the async stuff to really stabilize. That was there before, but I think 3.8 to me was it was stable. So if you are going to do this, you know, at least use 3.8. Um, and then when just you, to You had mentioned in our pre-conversations that um, this really fits like a glove with the network automation in particular that we're doing or infrastructure automation, distributed large scale systems with a lot of moving parts. And, and, you know, and this sort of synchronous method hasn't served us very well. Uh, I, I think you've demonstrated that clearly today, but, but for people who may be just catching up, right. We, we have thousands of devices potentially on the network distributed ge geographically and like we did today, go find a MAC address, go tell me where that infected client is so I can get it off the network. And I need to know now. Yeah, Jeremy's done that. He, we did that in an hour today. So uh, thank you for not just the code, but but for sharing with us your thought process and, and how you solve these problems. I think that's just as important as the Python you've showed us is your approach and your mentality and, and just the way you, you, you solve problems. So thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Enjoyed it. Um, we'll do it again sometime soon. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait to share this with my community and, and see it on YouTube. So thanks, Jeremy. Stay safe and have a great weekend. Okay. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye. Right, bye now.